uh, obviously a privilege for me to be able to uh, minister alongside my kids. I got kind of cracked up there for a second because halfway through the gospel reading, I, I spit and Eve, like, you know, looked and, like, looked down <laughs> and then just looked back up. <laughs> I started, uh, I started running again, and I say again because I, I realized a few months ago that although I still considered myself a runner, if you'd ask me, you know, what kind of what do you do for exercise, well, I run. Well, the truth is I haven't done it for like 10 years. <laughs> Any, anything you don't do for 10 years probably can't be used anymore when somebody asks you, you know, what you do in your recreational time. It's like somebody asking Don what he does and him saying, I play baseball. Well, yeah, it is true, sort of, but it was, you know, maybe a, a couple of months ago at least since Don picked up a, a ball in the back. Uh, at some point, you have to fess up to the fact that, eh, I just don't really do this much anymore. Um, well, I wanted to see if I could get back into running, but I also hate the heat. So I started running at night. And when you run late at night, I think probably, uh, probably the most important thing to remember, uh, if I could give you a tip, if you're running late at night, you know, usually I run between 10 and 11 or so. Uh, if you're running late at night, just try not to look guilty. Because <laughs> if you're running through your neighborhood and somebody sees you, it's very kind of, you know, they're jolting anyway. They're like, okay, what do you need to do? Like, where's he going? Did he steal something? Um, when you go several years also without, without jogging, you begin to, to get back and do it. Every, every time you do it, it seems, something different hurts. Um, of course, I didn't have this problem when I was 18. But now it's like every time I start running, you have that period of you know, 30, 45 seconds. You're like, okay, what's going to hurt today? It's a, now it's going to be my knee doing this weird thing. It's like my back. I've never felt that before. Or my, you know, my hamstring. Oh, it's, it's like trying to guess where the, where the pain is going to come from. Um, <laughs> I remember my mom told me the story a couple years ago of traveling with my grandmother. And... Uh, when my grandfather was still alive, and she, my dad took my grandmother to San Antonio, and she told me it was comical because every time, you know, every, every evening as they were there, uh, my grandmother would call my grandfather, and they'd do uh, the nightly roll call of aches and pains. It's like, what did you, what do you got today? She'd ask, and he would tell her, well, it's my, my ankle. I started doing this thing. It was weird, the sharp pain in my kidneys. I don't know what that is. Well, like, that's nothing, I should say. You know, my back's been hurting all day long. I've had this throbbing pain in both my knees. So much of our life, I think, is, is, is building endurance and dealing with the inevitable failure of our bodies. Uh, there's, a, there's a progression towards breakdown, right, that, that we all have to, to deal with. It reminds us of our humanity and our, our, our fragility. In Scripture, there are, are countless instances where man is reminded of his fragility. Where God breaks into our world just enough to remind us of our place in it. And how, how, how small we are in comparison to the Holy God, who's our Creator. I, I think this is, I'm sure, what Isaiah is feeling. Isaiah 6 was our, our Old Testament passage this morning. And to give you some context, you know, it opens up and says, you know, the year that King Uzziah died. And uh, I've talked a little bit about King Uzziah before, and if you know anything about Judah's history, you know that this must have been an especially difficult loss for the nation as a whole. Under Uzziah, the nation prospered. Uh, the, the borders were expanded uh, walls were added, towers were reconstructed. It's a large army that was kept. Um, desert areas were reclaimed uh, for agriculture through through water conservation processes. The, the nation enjoyed prosperity, strength, stability. <laughs> but uh, King Uzziah, late in life, got a little over eager. He tried uh, on one occasion to offer incense in the temple. Seems to be a noble thing to do, right? An act of worship. 
Well, unfortunately, that's something that, that only the priests could do. So he was struck with leprosy. Uh, but even for his later falls, Uzziah was a man who was eager to please God and was so good for his country in so many ways. So his passing had to have been incredibly difficult for the nation, especially for godly men like Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah and the other prophets and godly priests who were charged with uh, the spiritual help and the supervision of the people. When Uzziah dies, it had to be a blow. Passing of a great king. I'm sure probably also reminded everyone in the nation of the fact that life is short. Any moment to be taken from it. Humanity is frail. But of course, what is also true is sometimes in our moments of greatest fragility, God chooses to break through and reveal His glory. That's what we see in Isaiah 6. In this moment of sadness, of, of nationwide mourning, the king has died. What does God do? God reveals Himself in a dramatic way, in a way that He's never revealed Himself to anybody else before. Uncovering His plans for Isaiah and for the nation as a whole in the process. A nation is not built on the back of a king, but on the collective reliance on its creator. It's obviously a lesson here for us in that. But I think even more than that for us is, is, is that God reveals himself when and how we need him to. On this particular Sunday, we set aside a special day of worship. Hopefully you've kind of caught on already with the front of the bulletin and the, uh, you know, the, our, our processional hymn. Celebrating the Holy Trinity. This day was first marked on the church calendar about a hundred or so years ago. But really from the, the earliest moments of the church, the realization of this concept that God was in fact one, in three persons. The Holy Trinity and, and really the necessity of this doctrine for the true faith of the church. It's indispensable. This God that we worship is three in one. Of course, that sets us apart from Judaism and it sets us apart from Islam and gives us a, a grasp of, of the fullest expression of of God's revelation of himself to humanity. But of course, what, is, what does it mean for, for us? We can try to ponder the doctrine all day long, and the uh, seeming contradiction that's there of three and one, how can that possibly be? But more than, than the, the ins and outs of the doctrine itself, what does it mean for us? I would say the most important applications of this this concept is this. It means for us that God is always present. God is not just sitting on a throne somewhere as Isaiah sees him in the spirit. God was not just with us on the earth for those 33 or so years in the form of his son. God is ever present with us in the form of the Holy Spirit. That means we're never left alone. There's never a time that we are abandoned, even in our moments of greatest fragility or humanity or darkness. Even in the darkest hour of mankind, through uh, war and disease and chaos, Christians are walking here on earth. That means that the presence of the Almighty God is here as well. You know, the shadow of death may always loom ahead of us as our bodies start to progressively break down. We know that the light of the Spirit of God is ever present with us. It confirms the promises that He's made to us for everlasting life. Secondly, I think that 
the Trinity, the Trinitarian doctrine tells us that God is a God of relationship. We've been created in His image. God is a God of, of relationship. Even after the miracle of the resurrection, uh, before the ascension, Jesus still takes the time to teach and commune with His disciples. This is confusing, I think, to some theologians because they think, okay, well, if Christ came to die and His work on earth was finished, and he was resurrected, well, why wouldn't he just go straight up to heaven? His work is done. Right? The perfect sacrifice has been offered. What's left? Why stick around? Jesus continues to stick around, to commune, to eat with his disciples, to teach them, to spend time with them. I think this more than anything shows us that Jesus, relationships are important. Our interactions are not just uh, empty actions and, and preparation for some heavenly fulfillment. We talked this morning in our class about uh, what we experience now being a, a foretaste of glory divine, which is true. But there's a purpose behind our interactions with each other. There's a purpose Relationship has been modeled for us. We live in, in communion together in fellowship. This is the embodiment of the God that made us. He's ever dwelling in perfect relationship. Three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love Paul's closing words in his second letter to, to the Corinthians. His, his final benediction is actually... Uh, used as the closing benediction to our evening prayer service in the prayer book. Paul says this, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Paul understands that, that relationships are important. Part of his purpose in 2 Corinthians is to remind uh, the believers there that they can't just quit their jobs, sit on their couch, and wait for Jesus to come back. No, you have to continue to live your life. There's a purpose to why you're still here. For why the Lord tarries, to use that old English phrase, there's a reason why the Lord tarries his work to be done. Paul understands that the relationship that we have with Christ and in Christ should be reflected. It should seep into our relationships with each other. Be complete in your unity. Be unified in mind. And live in peace with one another. Let us pray as we close. Father, we're so astounded by the work and sacrifice of your Son. Pray that that truth will seep into our hearts in new, amazing ways that we would grapple once again anew with the love that you have for your people. As we try once again to, to ponder the, the Trinitarian doctrine Give us a renewed sense of your purpose for us and our relationships with each other. Bless us as we come to your table and meet us there. Hear all this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.